Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening today. Uh, as always, go get your free PDF, reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, I give a rundown of the top 200 drugs and some of the most important uh, things that you're going to see in clinical practice, as well as things that are going to show up on uh, pharmacology and, and board exams as well. So again, simply an email, uh, we'll get you that at reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, go get that free 31-page PDF. All right, so let's get into the drug of the day today, and that is Gemfibrazil. Uh, brand name of this medication is Lopid. Uh, it is an anti-cholesterol uh, type medication. Uh, also, probably the most common I hear in practice, it's a, a fibrate uh, type medication used in hypercholesterolemia. Uh, from a mechanism of action standpoint, I'll be honest, I had to uh, go and, and look this up. And of course, um, I was justified in, in my <laughs> knowledge of not knowing what this is. Uh, in that the mechanism of action is not well understood. And I've never, ever uh, recall in an exam being asked what, what the mechanism of action is for Jim Fibrazol. Um, it's because there's a bunch of theories on, on how it works, and um, it has associations with potentially uh, very low-density lipoproteins, so VLDL. Um, and, and different mechanisms that way, potentially. But again, it's all theories as to how the drug works. It's really not well understood. So um, that explained uh, potentially my knowledge gap there uh, and not knowing what the mechanism of action for gemfibrozil is. Uh, anyway, in clinical practice, where I see this medication used most often is elevated triglycerides. Uh, so patients with very significantly elevated triglycerides, um, usually in the ballpark of, you know, 500 or higher, up to 800 to 1,000 plus, um, these patients are at uh, potentially higher risk for pancreatitis. So with that, that's the situation that you're probably most likely to see uh, gemfibrozil used in. Now, there's some other fibrate derivatives as well, and I'll mention those in, in the drug interaction section um, as to why uh, gemfibrozil isn't used. So most often when I see patients on gemfibrozil, they've probably been on it for a really, really long time, okay? Um, so that is something um, that I look at um, and that I consider possibly uh, in geriatric patients where we're trying to reduce meds, that is a, a drug that I definitely look at and say, hey, why are they on this? You know, when was it started? And, and try to get a little bit more background info because um, maybe it's a potential target where we can uh, eliminate a medication there. So again, focus on those triglycerides with gemfibrozil. That's, that's usually where it's going to be used versus, you know, our statin medications, which are typically um, going to lead us down the road of, of focusing on LDL, for example. Uh, downside to gemfibrozil, uh, twice daily dosing, uh, that's a, a definitely a downside. And there are um, some drug interactions as well uh, that I'll, I'll definitely discuss coming up here in a little bit. Uh, adverse effect profile, uh, if you go and, and look at it, you're going to see a, a list of a ton of different stuff, and, and there's a lot of rare things that, that have been reported. Um, for your purposes and memorizing things, uh, GI upset is the most common complaint if patients are going to have an adverse effect. I think it's in the ballpark of you know 20% or, or something like that, but um, that is the most common one for sure, GI upset. Uh, yeah, rare issues, uh, hepatic issues, uh, rhabdomyolysis risk, skin reactions. So um, kind of a similar vein of uh, some of the statins with, you know, hepatic issues being rare, rhabdomyolysis being a, a rare potential complication. So that's kind of what I lump it in with um, as far as trying to remember uh, the adverse effect profile. And then obviously with the most common um, being that, that GI upset that can happen. So interestingly, administration is recommended to be before meals. So usually when a, a med can cause a little GI upset, usually we try to dose it with meals. Um, but it is recommended 30 minutes before meals. 
um, morning and evening, obviously, probably makes the most sense if you're doing twice daily dosing. Uh, and the reason for that is absorption. So absorption is reduced with food. So that's the reasoning behind it. Um, you know, have I seen it dosed with meals before? I likely have. Um, but the downside to that is you're probably going to get less efficacy and less benefit uh, from the, the medication there. Uh, renal function, you can keep an eye out for that. Um, dose reductions of, of kind of 50 to 75% are typically um, uh, recommended or, excuse me, a reduced dose uh, to 75% of the current dose uh, is what, what's recommended. So I, the, I think the important point is the, the cutoff that I remember anyway, uh, if you have a patient on this, is less than 50 mils per minute. And then usually I, I have to, to go look it up because, like I said, gemfibrozole isn't, isn't used crazy often uh, anymore, at least in, in my experience and in my practice there. Uh, onset, uh, this is an important patient education point. Um, you know, we usually check cholesterol every three to six months when we make changes and, and do things because uh, that process and, and cholesterol lowering effect generally does take a little while. And we want to make sure patients um, are at a, a steady state and that drug has had time to work. Um, and we want to see the results uh, after a, a period of time. So, um, that's usually uh, patient education, and, and you want to set those expectations with the patients that we're going to, you know, check cholesterol every three to six months as we're, you know, maybe uh, starting this medication, for example, there. All right, so let's take a quick break from our sponsor, and we will wrap up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material like BCPS, BCMTMS, ambulatory care, geriatrics, psychiatry. And if you're a student looking at NAPLEX content, definitely go check us out, meded101.com slash store. Uh, we've got links to all of our content there, all of our study materials. Uh, if you're a nurse, a, a med student, physician, another healthcare uh, professional, uh, I've got lots of different books. Uh, one recently on polypharmacy. I've got some on drug interactions. Lots of different resources uh, that involve case studies and, and different things as well. So, um, again, support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store, and all your purchases uh, through those links uh, help do that. So I'm greatly appreciative to those of you who have purchased something and uh, supported this podcast. Uh, in addition, if you like Audible listening, which you're listening to this podcast now, uh, I've got books on Audible as well, and you'll find those links uh, at meded101.com slash store. And in if you've never done Audible, you can actually get your first book for free. So go take advantage of that. You can get a six, eight-hour book of mine uh, absolutely for free, simply for trying Audible. And if you you know, don't like Audible, not going to use it, go ahead and, and cancel. The, they won't charge you. Um, but if you do, obviously, you can can keep doing it. I, I absolutely love uh, listening to, to books and podcasts and, and things um, all the time. Uh, with my, my busy schedule there. So definitely go check that out as well. Meded101.com slash store. All right, wrapping up with drug interactions. So uh, I mentioned the dosing. Um, I want to go back to that, why fe uh, why gemfibrozole isn't used as much. Um, so the dosing, that's one big reason. Uh, twice a day versus uh, some other fibrate medications are once a day. Uh, and then there's potential risk for a few more drug interactions with gemfibrozole compared to phenofibrate type products. So uh, with that drug interactions, uh, gemfibrozole does inhibit CYP2C8. Now that's not a crazy common enzyme. It's not like 3A4, for example, um, but there are some drugs uh, that may have their concentrations increased. So a, a couple examples I wanted to throw out, um, amiodarone, concentrations can can go up uh, if gemfibrozole is, is added on. That's obviously a pretty sensitive medication that we're using uh, for arrhythmias and things like that. Uh, Pioglitazone is an, another example. Um, not used very often anymore um, with diabetes, but its concentrations could go up there. And then uh, the question always comes up with statins and gemfibrozole, and it is recommended to avoid 
using uh, these together, gemfibrozil and statins, and the reason is there's an increased risk for rhabdomyolysis. Um, interestingly, so uh, simvastatin, atorvastatin, it's, it's recommended to absolutely avoid. Um, rosuvastatin actually does have language uh, where it recommends uh, up to a max of 10 milligrams if concomitant use is absolutely necessary. So uh, if you remember rosuvastatin, uh, typically the high dose range is 20 to 40 milligrams. Uh, they say to, to max out that dosing if gemfibrozil is added at 10. Um, and there again, we're going to obviously monitor for that increased risk of, of rhabdomyolysis and you know muscle soreness, that type of thing. Um, but uh, definitely important to remember that uh, interaction with statins and gemfibrozole. Uh, ezetimibe actually falls uh, under that category as well, uh, recommended to avoid use with gemfibrozole. Another uh, ezetimibe is another uh, uh, cholesterol type medication, and I believe I did a uh, podcast on that medication as well as the statins, of course. Uh, other drugs that may be impacted, so it can increase the concentrations of uh, Monte Lucas, so that'd be singular, the brand name there, um, also potentially can uh, increase the risk for hypoglycemia, particularly when patients are taking agents that cause hypoglycemia, and uh, the most notorious drug class there is, is going to be sulfonylureas. So, Maybe keep a little closer tabs on your diabetes patients if gemfibrozil is started there. Uh, and lastly, I, I can't leave out warfarin. Uh, gemfibrozil does have the uh, potential to raise warfarin concentrations, uh, so the dose of warfarin may need to be reduced. And we're typically going to you know, monitor and, and manage that by monitoring and, and following the INR. So... Um, yeah, those are. I, I think those are some of the, the big and, and most important drug interactions that you should know. Uh, with gemfibrozil, obviously, it's not an all-inclusive list that I went through, um, but I wanted to pull out some of the things that you actually might see uh, in clinical practice there. That's going to wrap up the podcast for today. If you enjoyed this episode, leave a rating review on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you're listening. Um, I'm greatly appreciative to those of you who have written some kind notes as well as uh, given us uh, four or five stars for sure. So definitely appreciate that. Get any comments, suggestions, uh, mededucation101 at gmail.com. Uh, otherwise, you can track me down on LinkedIn, uh, Eric Christensen, uh, PharmD, BCPS, BCGP. Uh, go sign up, subscribe, reallifepharmacology.com. Get your free 31-page PDF, a top 200 drugs. That's a no-brainer, I think, for you. Uh, also, check out the blog at meded101.com. Um, we've got uh, articles going up there uh, on, a, on a weekly basis, bi-weekly basis even. Um, different things that, that we talk about is things that I see in, in clinical practice and common questions uh, that you, you may come across as well as doing case studies and, and doing different things like that on the, the blog. So uh, definitely a cool little uh, resource, um, one that I've been putting my heart and soul into for about seven, eight years. So uh, go check that out as well. If you like that, go ahead and subscribe uh, at meded101.com as well. So uh, with that, I'm going to sign off. I thank you so much for listening and, and for your support, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.